Hello and welcome to Lunchtime Politics, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Coming up, President Bola Tinubu leaves Addis Ababa after the AU summit, which lasted two days. African leaders agree to no coup on the continent. More protests over hunger continues as some residents of Ibadan hit the streets to demand better action from the government following recent economic hardship. A Labour Party governorship aspirant in Edo State, Olimida Akpata, raises concern over party's level of preparations for his primary, says lack of transparency by the leadership is recipe for chaos. Let's get things started from the presidency, where President Bola Tinubu has departed at Ababa, Ethiopia, venue of the 37th Ordinary Session of the Assembly of the African Union for Abuja, where there, while there, the president actively participated in the 44th Ordinary Session of the Executive Council held bilateral meetings and attended other events on the sidelines of the AU summit. On the military takeovers in the republics of Guinea, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, and the exit of three of these nations from ECOWAS, President Bola Tinubu said disagreements over the unconstitutional changes of government should not mean the permanent rupture of the abiding lines of regional affinity and cooperation. Just yesterday, the president and his Brazilian counterpart, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, agreed to forge stronger bilateral ties across all sectors. President Tinubu emphasized the strength of Nigeria's economic potential and influence, saying the country is witnessing and live forward despite some short form or short term reform pains. <clears throat> And one of the developments that the president will be coming back to is what's happening in Ibadan. You see on your screen, the Oyo State Capitol, where they have joined the protest against current economic hardship being witnessed in the country. The protesters have at least three convergent points at the war, Shongo and Mokola, where they were seen carrying placards with different inscriptions depicting the depth of the agitations. They chanted various songs calling on the government to live up to their electoral promises and stop the sufferings across Nigeria. There's every presence of security deployed to ensure no breakdown of law and order as designated spots for the protest. Similar protests took place in parts of the north just a few weeks ago. And the issue of economic hardship and its attendant uh, impacts on citizens uh, is what we will start with on the program today. I'm being joined from our Abuja studio, two gentlemen, uh, Bimbo Daramola, former member of the House of Reps and an APC member, as well as Dimeji Fabi, member of the Atiku, or now the former Atiku Presidential Campaign Council. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, I understand that Bimbo will be joining us via Zoom. Uh, let me take your reaction, Mr. Dimeji, on this particular development. What do you make of the situation going on in the country as far as the uh, economic, the impacts of the economic policy of the federal government is concerned? We're seeing protests about hunger. It started in the north, now it's trickling down to the south. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Nigerians, and thank you for bringing me. First, I'd like to... Um, Sympathize with Nigerians um, with the situation they have found themselves at this moment. Uh, it's a pity Nigerians are really suffering. And you can see that in most of the reactions of the people. Nigerians have become desperate. Uh, you, can, you can always agree with me that um, the last eight years, the eight years of President Muhammadu Bari's administration 
was not even, it was not better. So they've been going through this same pro process, this same hardship, the same situation. They went through it eight years. Now it's continuing with this government. Uh, my take is very simple. Uh, you come into a position of authority, believing that you have what it takes to make necessary changes to fix the situation. So excuse should not be given to anybody in governance because you've lost that right. Because you have come on board with the belief and that you've told people you can fix one, two, three that are germane to their being, to their welfare, to, to their lives. But unfortunately, what we are witnessing in Nigeria is quite pathetic. And then I feel pain because uh, for me, uh, nobody can do it alone. Regardless of what you went through during, during your cam campaign, uh, campaign period, you have an opposition today, you have won. And if an opposition, opposition is part of governance, and if an opposition is coming out to say, why not consider this? I feel very, very disgusted. I feel irritated when I see the way President's people, President's men, Mr. President men are reacting to you know, objective you know, you know, solutions and suggestions from the members of opposition, particularly the former Vice President Atikwa Obaka. You can't take it away from him, his journey and, and, and in, in governance and politics. He has been there. So when people like, when someone like that says something, what a responsible government would do would be to listen to him, to look at whatever suggestions or provision he has, he has brought forward. But unfortunately, <clears throat> it's not like that. President uh, Admission of Buhari did the same thing. And that was why the issue of insecurity lasted for that long that it lasted. So again now, the economic situation is in bad shape. Nobody would agree with me. Uh, even the members of the ruling government are complaining, but it's just that they cannot come out to say yes or uh, to criticize their government. So that if is why the session we have moment. found ourselves in Nigeria today. If yes. I may butt in for a moment, uh, but the, the government has said that it, the pain is short term, uh, that things are going to get better. Do you see what they are seeing? Let me tell you this. Uh, I do not really share that. And I'll tell you why I don't share that. The, the last administration said the same thing. And we went through it for eight years. And it was as a result of that that this government inherited those backlogs. And we are still there. So like I said earlier, uh, you should know before you come in. Because some of us saw this. At the twilight of that government, we knew the economy is going to, it was heading for a ditch. And our belief was, was that anybody who is coming in should have realized, should have seen this and prepared very well for it. So you don't throw in uh, policies that will not work, that will not address the immediate challenges of the people. So you can't blame people for saying they cannot be patient anymore because they've been patient enough. And we believe that when you come in, when you are coming in, uh, you have what it takes to fix it. Look at the FX regime is one of the biggest challenge we're having in this country. Yesterday, somebody was telling me that uh, another tax burden is going to be placed on the aviation industry. How would that work? So rather than fixing the FX problem, you are imposing more taxes. All right, How would that all right. work? All right, so, Mr. Yeah. Fabi, I need to get the input of, my apologies, but I need to get the input of Mr. Damarola, Daramola, rather. Uh, who is joining us via Zoom. He's a former member of the House and as well as an APC member. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, you heard Mr. Fabi saying that it appears your party was not prepared. And these were the same excuses. So call for patients that preceded the Buhari administration or at the beginning of the Buhari administration and how things ended that we know. And this has started again. So it appears not to trust this call for patients. Well, um, good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead, please. All right, very well. Um, good morning. Um, let me say to you that, yes, these are very challenging times. And I'm not going to beg the issue. Um, hunger, insecurity, and all of these things that people have alluded to cannot but be spotlighted at a time like this. Let me make it abundantly clear to you that Hunger does not respect tribe. It doesn't respect social status. It doesn't respect complexion. It doesn't respect anything else. What hunger will respond to and respect is to have something in your stomach. So that Nigerians are emptying into the streets, particularly the ones that are very sincere. 
are not the ones that are politically motivated. They have legitimate, super legitimate cause for worry. But let me say to Nigerians that whoever would take a very, very generous look at global economies and economy today, you will see that virtually all major economies in this in this in this in the world today are taking the heat. Yes, Nigerians don't want us to do this comparative analysis, but it is clear that there's an integrated global economy that Nigeria functions in the matrix of that. We have our local peculiarities, and that is why a job has been given to this president. But let me say this to you, my brother. No matter how proficient, no matter who you are, there's no magic wand to solve this problem. There's no magic wand. Number two is the fact that I've heard it, I've heard somebody say somewhere, or I've written it, I read it somewhere where somebody um, alluded to the fact that, oh, Ashura, you wanted the job, now he's got the job, and all of that. Regardless of who, who, are, who may have gotten the job, Nobody will have come to this job with a magic wand. Nobody could have. In the light of the realities, even on my page today, today, on my page on Facebook today, I posted something there. I couldn't have been able to say or couldn't have imagined for all of my life that all of these malfeasance that we've seen, that we saw, that practically defined the Buhari administration, could have happened in this country. And you're not and you're not thinking that there, there will be consequences. So there will be consequences. The choices that we make will determine the consequences that trail those choices. Today we are seeing stagflation, runaway inflation, and all of those things. We must also I did geology in school. I'm a geologist, and there's a reason for studying fossils, it's called paleontology. When you study fossils, you want to be able to use the past to predict the present, to understand the present, and predict the future. In local terms here, yeah, what we should be talking about now is what B.E. has said. Let's get into that room, and I, I, strongly, I strongly would advise. President Ambassador just did the same thing when we came into power in 1999. Listen, we have just one country. And we have a national to take care of. Whoever has any so, solution, so that so, we go, no, land on your thoughts. Land on your thoughts, sir. Whoever has any solution that I could take us out of this quagmire, we will be welcome. I am aware that President and Vice President Atiku Abaka had brought things to the table, and a number of people had also made suggestions. But I can tell you, my brother, no matter the suggestion at this time, there is no quick fix. And let me quickly say something to you. If you know, I know Vice President Atiku Abaka extremely well, and I know Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed, President, very well. I am not too sure that anybody will say, anybody who knows Ashiwaju will say that Ashiwaju can run government from the blueprint of IMF, not the Ashiwaju that I know. So do you all think that we all that I and I'm not backing the issue. I have known Ashwaju for 28 years. And I know he's so strong willed enough. I am too sure that everybody knows Ashwaju as a headhunter. This so, economy and the way things are turning must be a clear embarrassment to him. Granted the capacity that we know him. So so however, that, that, Mr. Daramola, if I may butt in because on, of time. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. What I'm now saying today is that we need to get together now. And the president needs to get together, look at the fact that, one, Nigerian economy is also in the global economy. So whatever heat that the UK economy, the American economy gets, will trickle down to hearts. There are three or four things that are worrying us today, that are major issues today. One, the dollar falling, having a free fall. Two, Hunger and three is security, and all of them are interrelated. One cannot fix one and leave the other. So I have my own postulations about what 
maybe we All right, Mr. Dermola, let, let me get back. Let me get back to Mr. Fabi. I wanted to ask you a question, a follow-up question, but because of time, let me get back to Mr. Fabi. Mr. Fabi, let me come back to you. Uh, he's made propositions. I don't know what your response are to this, some of the things he said before I throw in my question. I just wanted to, you to react to some of the things he said. Okay, thank you very much. I think I quite agree with Honorable Dramola you know, to, to, some, to, to some extent. But the fact remains that our economic solution, I'm, not, I'm talking economically now, our economic solution does not lie in borrowing funds in going to look for solution abroad. We need... What we need is homegrown economic solution, and these things are possible. You can't generate FX if you don't produce and export. It's a simple mathematics. And I don't think that should be difficult, too difficult for the current leadership to know what you need, what they should have done would have been to concentrate on things that will show up economy within the country. It's possible. So for me, the issue of insecurity, when you have insecurity, there's no how your economy can, 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 so, can succeed or can excel. So you fix the economy. If at the same time, you can look inward and think outside the box and run, I mean, and put all of these things together. So Gentlemen. I agree with him. But my, my take is that, and this is an advice to the government of President Bola, I mean, a lot of people have hopes on him, and he won't have any excuse because he controls the National Assembly, he has the security, he has judiciary, he has everybody at his back and call. nobody will excuse him. So his government should not be too arrogant to seek help when one is needed. For the sake right, of I Nigeria. Think that, I think that's where the consensus is uh, from both of you, gentlemen. I'm in Europe, I will not pity him, and I'll tell you the truth. Uh, all right, so gentlemen. what matters most is that should, his government should uh, not be arrogant. All right, they gentlemen. Seek help where and there are people who are ready to help. All right, uh, all right, Miss, Mr. Fabi, oh, thank oh, you so oh, much for your thoughts. Yes. Uh, thank unfortunately, you. we're totally out of time. I must thank you, Mr. Bimbo Daramola, former House of Reps member and an APC member. I think I, I have to bring you back uh, for also to have more of this conversation as well as uh, Mr. Dimeji Fabi, uh, a former uh, spokesperson for the Presidential Council, because there's a lot to talk about. At the end of the day, we want a country that works. However it works is what is important to us. I want to okay. thank you both, gentlemen, for coming on the program. We're going to have an extensive conversation on this later on. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right, then. Well, we'll go on a quick break. When we come back, we'll switch gears now to some of the developments in the Edo State politics, especially that has to do with both the APC and the Labour Party. Join us again. Welcome back. Barely hours after the All Progressives Congress in Edo State conducted its primary ahead of the September the 21st governorship election, a third candidate emerged from the exercise. The latest is a member representing a sack of federal constituency, and Amaro Dekere in his acceptance speech. Mr. Uh, Dekere thanks supporters and party leadership for their support. Earlier on Saturday, the chairman of the APC Edo governorship electoral committee and Imo State Governor Hopo Zadima announced uh, Mr. Dennis Edahosa as the winner of the governorship election. Similarly, Senator representing Edo Central, Senator District Monday Okwebolo, was equally declared as winner on Saturday, 17th of February. With all humility and with a great sense of responsibility, I accept this choice, which I believe is a reflection of God's choice. From the depth of my heart, I say a big thank you to you, members of our great party in the district, for depositing this huge confidence in me, which I must say I do not take for granted. I must also thank critical stakeholders, especially the states and the national, national working committee, for existing of the total adherence to the electoral guidelines as stipulated in the timetable. Let me also appreciate the electoral umpire, the independent national, national electoral commission, and ensuring transparency, transparency in the product of the election. We salute the party leadership in rising to the occasion and members who were resolute in their desire to exercise their franchise, which they willingly really gave to me. While awaiting the affirmation of my victory by the work of war delegates as stipulated in the guidelines and other relevant laws, I wish to assure you that. In the, next few, in the next few days, I shall be upgrading my electoral manifesto, Christine, 
Bachelor of Home Affairs. I therefore call on my party, call on our party members, and the those in general to build their lawyers and join our campaign effort to form the next government in the state, a government that will care for you and your children and that will build your suffering. Well, interesting things happening in Edo State, uh, as far as the APC is concerned. Now, before the election, things look quite organized uh, because uh, there were releases in terms of how to prepare for the election. Uh, but right now, what we're seeing, at the end of that exercise, three persons are claiming victory to that exercise. Uh, and it's so, it's so interesting that the basic question after the election cannot be answered. Basic question well, is, as such as, who scored the highest number of votes? Everybody is claiming a number. What was the venue of the approved secretary to collate results and approve primary election results? That is under contention. Who can legally declare a winner between the primary election committee and the state returning officer, Hopu Zadima, the governor, and Stanley Buago? That cannot be answered as well. And now we have the third candidate. So we've been joined on the program by uh, a public affairs analyst, Mr. Nuruddin Asunoge. Thank you, Mr. Nuruddin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, let's go to the very basic. Is this, uh, what do you make of the situation with the Doe State APC primary outcome? Is, is this this conundrum or, or is just these politicians being politicians? Well, I, I want to begin by saying that what has happened so far is uh, most lacrimos. One had thought that... Uh, given the fact that this is the very first election primary, so to speak, that uh, the party will be involved in after the controversial presidential election, they were going to don the wrapper of immaculation by ensuring that what was uh, going to happen was going to be transparent. But like, as you have seen, the discombobulation, the confusion that had trailed this is uh, beginning to create the impression that that exactly is what their DNA is, what their identity is. Uh, otherwise, from the very beginning, it is obvious that uh, you, you had an amalgam of a people who believe in the strategy of divide and conquer. And so even within themselves, those who intend to provide superintendence over the, 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 the people of uh, those states do not in the very first instance, believe in themselves. They are lean in integrity because it will take only a people who are lean in integrity to be caught up in a, a charade of this nature. That basically is what we, 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 we are confronted with. Otherwise, how do you explain that in the very first instance, the very first attempt they made, which was not characterized by integrity, was the fact that you said you wanted to prune the number of candidates for this election. And a number of persons were asking the questions, why did you make the criteria that you were going to use in pruning so opaque? Why was it so nebulous? What are the issues? What were you going to use in deciding who runs and who does not run? And there was a disagreement. The National Working Committee came up to say, okay, fine, whoever it is that has the resources to buy the phone can participate. The belief was that some element of integrity, some element of honesty was being injected into it. Now they had a primary that was no primary because you can't tell where, like you have rightly pointed out, where was the center? Where did these people vote? You said it was going to be by open water, which meant that those who would participate would be bona fide members of APC. And there is only one way by which you can determine who your member is. It is that there is a register. And so where was the register? Those who participated, did they have access to this register as to authenticate those who were coming to vote, assuming there was voting? And sadly enough, we have had, we first had two, 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 two different announcements by persons who were operating from the national level. And one of the contestants who was supposedly said to have said, okay, the, the process is acceptable to me, is not the one, the, the one representing ESACO. Uh, is like a constituency announcing himself as one of the winners. I thought that the president, you see, the late president right. Yara Dua had admitted that the process that threw him up was a All right. flawed process. He was All going right. to do everything he could to deep in okay. and clean up the mess. 
So, All right, Mr. Nuru, we, we are in a state again. of confusion, even as the leader is. Right, Mr. Asanoge, I want to thank you so much. Uh, uh, there's a lot I can see you want to share with us because I wanted to ask you and have your take on the issue of uh, internal in democracy within political parties, but we don't have any more time, maybe some other time. I want to thank you, Public Affairs Analyst Mr. Anuruddin Asanoge, who joined us via Zoom from Benin City. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. And now to a troubling signal in the Edo State Labour Party, raised by one of its governorship aspirants, Mr. Alumida Akbata, who alleges that the party's leadership appears shoddy and dishonest in its preparations for their primary on February the 23rd. A former NBA president claims lack of transparency ahead of Thursday's exercise, and he says it's a recipe for disaster as some aspirants have now pulled out of the race. In a letter to the INEC chairman, Mr. Akbata says the dirt of information and transparency surrounding the primary election process cast serious doubts on sincerity of the Labour Party in, his, in conducting fair, credible and democratic primaries to produce a governorship candidate. Mr. Akbata asked the electoral umpire to prevail on the Labour Party over the issue while distancing himself from insinuations that the entire alleged plot is for his benefit. And just before we go, this uh, just story just coming in, a former governor of Kwara State, Mr. Abdul Fattah Ahmed, is currently being quizzed by operatives of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, over a transaction running into billions of Naira during his time as governor of the state. So this is breaking news just coming in. A former governor of Kwara State, Abdul Fattah Ahmed, is being quizzed by the EFCC over a transaction running, running into billions of Naira during his tenure as governor of the state. And that's it on the program. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, your usual company, I'm Jeffrey Ozonga. You've been served on lunchtime.